The next category recognizes some of the greats in the field of broadcasting. And it's appropriate that the presenter fits into that category himself. Last year at the first dinner, he was inducted into the broadcaster's wing of the New York Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Through the years, he has been the voice of the Knicks. You all recall good like Needix, the Giants and the Jets on the radio, innumerable national broadcasts. He was one of the very first jocks turned broadcasters, but not in the fashion of some who bumble through in that regard. Marty Glickman was a once great athlete who became a truly distinguished man behind the microphone. He was a tremendous basketball and especially football player at Syracuse University, a member of the 1936 American Olympic team that marched into the Olympic Stadium in Berlin under the gaze of Adolf Hitler, a teammate of Jesse Owens and Ralph Metcalf. At one time, he was among the fastest men alive. He's moving a little bit more slowly these days after having just had a hip replacement, but he still looks great and especially sounds great. A warm welcome, please, for Marty Glickman. Thanks, Shorty. <laughs> My chore this evening, a most pleasant one. The names I'm to present to you are as well known in your home as your own. Certainly, the names of Don Dunphy, Vince Scully, Marv Albert need no introduction from me. You know virtually all about them. But it's almost proper and fitting that I present them because I was there at their beginnings, their very first broadcasts, their earliest beginnings in broadcasting. Marv Albert can't be with us tonight. His mother passed away last week. He's sitting shiver at home. Marv was a, a ball boy for the New York Knicks when he was 14 years of age when I was broadcasting those ball games and he aspired to be a broadcaster. And he got to be one of the very best there is. He is perhaps the most rounded sports broadcaster in the business, certainly the busiest in the business today, starting with the New York Knicks way back in the late 70s, late 60s rather, and through the championship years of 70 and 73. But I remember him as a kid, as a 14-year-old who was quiet and shy and unassuming, if a sports broadcaster could be quiet and shy and unassuming. Marv Albert certainly was. So I present for your ratification into the Sports Hall of Fame, Marv Albert. Back in 1940, the Gillette Razor Company took over the broadcast of boxing at Madison Square Garden and throughout the country as well. Previous to that time, there had been a number of well-known fight broadcasters. Sam Taub and Angelo Palangi, perhaps, were the best-known combination in the group. And uh, Clem McCarthy did a good deal of boxing as well as horse racing. You remember that famous story about Clem and Bill Stern at the uh, uh, following the Kentucky Derby. Uh, the Preakness, that's right, when uh, Clem, for the first time, called the wrong winner. It was an entry, and uh, Bill kept sort of rubbing it in. As we say in Yiddish, he stucht him. Uh, kept mentioning the fact that he called the, the wrong winner on, on the broadcast, and finally Clem had it up to here, and Clem said, well, Bill, you know you can't lateral a horse. <laughs> Broadcasters will remember that one. At any rate, Gillette, Gillette organized an audition of a light heavyweight fight at Madison Square Garden, wherein the best broadcasters in America were invited to compete for the job as the fight announcer in the years to come. The best there were, Bill Stern for two rounds, Ted Using for two rounds, Bill Slater for a couple of rounds, Earl Harper, a well-known New York broadcaster then, for a couple of rounds. My old boss, Bert Lee, for a couple of rounds. Dick Fischel, who preceded me in doing the giant games so many years ago. 
former Syracuse athlete, for a couple of rounds. And there was room for a kid named Don Dunphy. They could fit him in in the latter portions of the fight. He was a virtual unknown. He'd been at Manhattan College, a New York City boy, and uh, had been on the track team there, a middle distance runner, ran the 400, the 800, uh, helped win several pen relays for Manhattan College, and was a sports director at WINS, did all sports. He was in the audition as well. No one thought he had a chance. He won the audition. And since that time, he's been making boxing history. He's broadcast on radio and TV more than 2,000 prize fights, more than 200 championship fights, 50 world's heavyweight championship fights. The voice of boxing for low these many years, an old friend and dear friend, Don Dunphy. Don. Thank you very much, Marty. I want to say this, that uh, one of the achievements of my career was the fact that I did other sports besides boxing. I did a football game once in, uh, up at Cornell, where they were playing Syracuse, and described two touchdowns scored by Marty Glickman. <laughs> that, that wasn't yesterday, either. <laughs> I must say this, that to be inducted into any Hall of Fame is a, a remarkable thing for any person. But to be inducted into the Hall of Fame of the city where you were born, where you were educated, and where you worked is something beyond even that. I was very lucky during my career. I practically knew, except for Graham McNamee, I knew every great sports announcer of the 1920s and 30s, Ted Using, Bill Slater, Clem McCarthy, Red Bob later on. I knew Marty Glickman himself, Vin Scully, Kurt Gowdy, and all the greats. So I just figure I was a very, very lucky person. I want to thank Bill Shannon and the members of the committee of the New York Sports Hall of Fame for having me inducted tonight, because it certainly is wonderful to be inducted into that company. Thank you very much. The morning following that football game, I get a phone call at my fraternity house in Syracuse saying, Marty, frankly, we want to cash in on your publicity. Will you do a college radio broadcast for us? It was a local haberdasher in Syracuse. And I said, you don't mean me. I'm nervous. I stutter. I stammer. I've never been on the air. He said, I'll pay you $15 a broadcast. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> That's how I started broadcasting. Not quite the same way is Vince Scully. Vince Scully, who comes out of Bogota, New Jersey, that is, went to Fordham, served a, a hitch in the Navy in World War II, went back to Fordham, worked for WFUV, the Fordham FM radio station on campus. Did some work in 1949 for Red Barber on football. Uh, Red had a roundup of football games. Red was so impressed that when the Brooklyn Dodgers went from just radio to radio and TV, and they needed the third broadcaster, Vince Scully was selected by Red for that job. And I think that even to this day, that trio of Barber, Connie Desmond, and Vince Scully may well be and have been the best three-man combination in the history of baseball broadcasting. They were really that good. I said I was there at the beginning. I was. I was then working at WHN, and the Brooklyn Dodger games were broadcast on WHN. I remember his first broadcast. He was good. Nervous a bit, a little high-pitched because of the nervousness. And from that point on, he's gone on to do baseball of a national character on NBC, before that on CBS. Of course, he does the broadcast of the Brooklyn Dodger baseball games now. And he's one of the great golf broadcasters in the country. An old and dear friend from New York's Fordham, Vince Scully. Ben?
Thank you, Marty. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't mind, I would like to share one thing with you. And I feel particularly pain for Marv Albert because one of the great joys of coming back here was I spent last night at dinner out sharing a glass of wine with my 90-year-old mother. So I can understand how he feels. But my mother kind of figures into how I feel tonight because many years ago, Ralph Branca, the great Dodger pitcher, and his wife Ann and I were making a trip around the world, and we had an audience with the Pope. He was then uh, Pope Pius. He was formerly Cardinal Pacelli, and he was very much a holy man who looked like he had stepped off a holy picture card. So the morning came for the audience with the Pope, and it is very well planned. They move you from room to room to room. And finally, you were in the last room next to the Pope's apartment, and there were about 20 people. We formed in a U, and the Pope came in, and there were these windows, French windows, with the light streaming through, and it was really an overwhelming sight. Now, my now 90-year-old mother, red-haired Irish lady, had said to me, remember every moment of the audience so that you can share it with me when you come home. I said, yes, Mom, yes, Mom. And now the Pope began to work his way around the 20 people. And he spoke all the languages, in German, in French, in Italian. Now he came to the English contingent, and he spoke in English. They had instructed us not to speak to the Pope. You would reply if the Pope spoke to you. And as he worked his way around, I was getting more nervous by the moment, and I kept thinking, now, Mom wants to know everything, so remember everything. And now he came to Ralph Branca, and he said, where are you from, my son? And Ralph said, Mount Vernon, New York, your holiness. Oh, the Pope said, I know exactly, north of the Bronx. Wonderful. Now he turned to Anne, and Anne violated the rule. She had some rosaries in her hand, and she said, would you bless my family, your holiness? And he did. And now he turned, and here was my moment. And I'm thinking, remember every word, every nuance, every look, so that you can bring it home to your mother. And I swear to God, he turned and looked at me and said, are you with them? <laughs> and I went like that, and he moved on. <clears throat> I am honored. I am delighted, I am humbled, I'm with them. <laughs>